everyone. Um, welcome to Crisis in Post-Truth Politics, Comparing North American, North America and Europe. Um, today we're going to have a virtual roundtable with Michael Carpenter, Maria Finn's daughter, and Benjamin Perrier. Um, I'm Shauke Van Beek. I'll be moderating this morning. Um, so I'll begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, and I would like to mark the violent histories of where we are with making note of and reminding us of the ongoing conflicts and contradictions of this land, this water, and this air. The land, the land occupied by the University of Victoria is the territory of the Clans and Wasanich peoples, and the city remains home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. These Americas are built on violence and erasure, and we bring these histories with us, those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as white settlers by conquest and those who have come here by force or otherwise as a result of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and ongoing wars. When we enter any room, even or especially virtual rooms, we must bring these histories into view. It is with this knowledge that we enter here and we make hopes of making a different world. As this meeting is virtual, I realize that virtual spaces can often feel um, disembodied or untethered. So I want to remind us that we are always connected to the earth and all of our online activity has real ramifications for other humans, as well as the lands and as non-human inhabitants. As we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that this land acknowledgement may not be the territory that you are currently on. I ask that if this is the case, you take responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on, as well as the current treaty holders, and consider in that case what it means to live in reciprocity. Um, today's event will be a part of the special events that are taking place for ICSA or European Community Studies Association Canada's 25th anniversary. On the screen, I have a list of other events um, that are being hosted by other professors throughout Canada. Um, and these events will be taking place from May 2nd until the 11th. Uh, today, we have three presenters. Uh, so we're going to have each presenter present for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to follow that time with a question and answer period. Uh, this is meant to be conversational. If you have questions during the uh, presentations, feel free to use the chat function. Uh, we do ask so that in the chat function, uh, people are respectful and mindful of other people's feelings. Um, so we'll begin with uh, Michael, then move on to Maria and then Benjamin. Each of these uh, presenters are at University of Victoria right now uh, and part of the CFGS community. So welcome and thank you. Uh, we'll begin with Michael Carpenter. I'm going to stop. Uh, Michael is a postdoctoral researcher with Borders and Globalization at the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria. He has a PhD in political science from the University of Victoria and an MA in social and political thought from the University of Regina. He has a background in social movements, civil resistance theory, Middle Eastern politics, and Palestinian popular struggle. He's currently working on crisis and contentious politics in the European Union and theories of borders in civil disobedience. So with that, Michael, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Shokia. And thank you for the invitation to be here. Please let me know if there's anything up with my audio or video. Um, I want to thank uh, Borders and Globalization for uh, their support, uh, particularly Emmanuel Brunet Jai and uh, Helga Hel uh, Helgram's daughter, the Center for Global Studies, all of the colleagues here, and uh, everyone who is uh, showing up to listen in and join in the conversation. I also want to emphasize, Shokia, that was a great land acknowledgement. And I just want to stress that as a third generation, um, European settler. Actually, I'm going to just bring up my screen for everyone to uh, to see what I'm looking at. All right. So my my presentation is called "Truckers and Post Truth Politics: Crisis as Common Dominator, not uh, Denominator, but Dominator." As a third generation European settler to Turtle Island. I acknowledge that the university is located on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen, Wasainich, and Esquimalt peoples, whose traditional relationships with the land go back thousands of years. I also call out ongoing suppression and dispossession of Indigenous peoples by the colonial state and extractive industries. So, um, 
just a bit of a disclaimer also before I get going, I'm not going to be going too in depth into the trucker movement that uh, kind of captivated this, uh, the country and so much of the world for a period of about three weeks, if you'll remember, just before Russia invaded Ukraine, that was top news. Um, this isn't based on original research. Rather, I want to take this opportunity to sort of do some early thinking about the relationship between crisis and contentious politics in this context. So I'm floating some trial balloons, I'm trying to give some different, uh, maybe even controversial or provocative perspectives on this issue, recognizing that this is a safe space for ideas, even if they're um, a little bit uh, uncomfortable, and I encourage pushback in the discussion. Basically, what I want to do this morning in a very limited time is say a few words about the cross-Atlantic comparison of crisis and post-truth. Then I want to uh, uh, briefly recap the trucker movement and end with a critique of, this is sort of the argument I'm sneaking into this, uh, this presentation, and with a critique of the emphasis on social media as the primary culprit here. I think there's been too much emphasis on the regulation of speech, fear of bots, uh, misinformation, fake news. All of that is serious stuff, but I think the problem, the real problem to be focusing on more importantly uh, is much bigger than that and not so easy to point the finger at or solve and that's the crisis itself or the series of crises themselves so let's first um, jump right into the first part here to touch on a comparison across the atlantic uh, we can see a lot of similarities and differences between sort of the experience of post-truth and crisis in europe versus in north america and first of all, I think that from the view from North America and especially from Canada has sort of been that Europe can't get a break, right? It's kind of been a, a, a rocky road for Europe for the last 10 or 15 years, starting of course with that 2008 global financial crisis, which uh, affected North America as well. And maybe Canada was not so severely impacted. Though it originated in the US and it severely hit the US as well, in some ways it seemed to hit Europe worse because there was the issue of the European Union and the, the threatened breakup of the Eurozone with countries facing bankruptcy and dramatic rise of right-wing politics. So the 2008 global financial crisis hit Europe pretty hard. And on the heels of that came the migrant or refugee crisis, which was really a crisis for those people fleeing war and impoverishment across the Middle East and North Africa, but also a crisis for Europe, uh, which was inequipped for uh, handling uh, an increase in refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, and also for further fueling um, sort of conservative rise of uh, populist and far right uh, politics. Fast on the heels of that or bound up with the migrant crisis was Brexit in 2016, of course, major crisis for the European Union. Nobody, excuse me, nobody really predicted that uh, Britain would actually vote to leave the Union. Of course, 2020 was when coronavirus hit, and that's a shared global experience that I don't need to uh, elaborate on here. And then uh, just as we seem to be coming out of that, uh, uh, Europe is now dealing with war as Russia invaded Ukraine uh, earlier this year. This is not to say that North America has been spared. There's a lot of overlap between these crises. Of course, the global financial crisis, COVID. And let's not, let's not diminish the seriousness of the crisis of the election of Donald Trump in 2016 to American politics and social life. If you cast your mind back, the country went into a, a, a lot of real hysteria uh, when Donald Trump was unexpectedly uh, uh, elected in an upset victory. And it dominated, you know, suddenly everything was politicized. The nighttime talk shows, the daytime talk shows, water cooler conversations. It was a very polarizing moment of uncertainty. And of course, a lot of the media and political establishment went into kind of a crisis or even hysteria mode over Trump, as if it's not bad enough to focus on his actual policies and critique. Uh, what he's doing in, in government, but there's so much hysteria, even fake news around this sort of conspiracy theory of 
Trump was Putin's puppet, right? That Russia had installed Donald Trump. It was a coup or he had information on Donald Trump. There was the infamous P tape. So there was a lot of hysteria uh, and uh, shaking up of the American system with the election of Donald Trump. And the US has also had its own migrant crises, of course, on its Southern border. During this period, uh, more in the last few years, five years, migrant caravans coming up from Latin America through Mexico, thousands of thousands of asylum seekers. Uh, we hear stories of people, uh, children ending up in cages, families being separated, thousands of people uh, being uh, uh, gathering outside of the U.S. southern border. 2020, the U.S. was hit not just with the coronavirus pandemic, but the largest social protests in American history uh, rocked the country over the summer and into the fall. Well, race protests uh, over the um, uh, the really about police violence and racial injustice in, in the United States. Canada um, had its own sort of mini crisis when the trucker convoy uh, sort of paralyzed and captivated our media attention and and became a threat to the, the, the economy and different economic sectors. All of these crises, the, the over the shared and the distinct, um, are sort of bound up in uh, and complicated by post-truth. The, the symptoms of post-truth permeate these crises, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, um, conspiracy theories, and the rise of a general public malaise or distrust in uh, in public authorities. You should see a couple of images from the trucker protest as um, hundreds of big rigs converged on the nation's capital. And really it was a period of about three weeks between late January and into February when these the, the trucks began their occupation around Parliament Hill and highly disruptive protests with the uh, honking of horns around the clock, trying to really make things inconvenient for the people of Ottawa and in particular for the government to pressure them to change along their key demand, the core demand, the original demand that animated the movement was to end the vaccine mandates. In particular, they were concerned about mandates about truckers needing to um, uh, be vaccinated to cross the border and also to give tests, uh, uh, negative tests at both sides of the border. Some of this is outside of the Canadian government's control because of the US uh, governance of the southern, of, of its northern border. Um, and as time went on, uh, the demands of the movement were kind of a little bit all over the map. And at some points, it be, they became very uh, sort of extremist and, and less plausible as they, some aspects of the movement were calling for the dissolution of the government, of the, the, the liberal government in Canada. But on the whole, the, uh, uh, the core demands about loosening government restrictions did enjoy some support among the Canadian public, or close to half of the Canadian public, according to Ipsos uh, polling data carried out multiple times during the protest, showed that almost half of Canadians supported or were sympathetic to the concerns around uh, vaccine mandates. But the vast majority of the country and the political establishment were, there was very much consensus against the tactics that were used. The tactics were viewed as too disruptive, uh, sort of beyond the pale, unacceptable. Uh, and this is why uh, the government ended up uh, invoking the Emergency Act. Now, who were the protesters? Mostly they were conservatives, not entirely from the conservative part of the spectrum, but mostly conservative, including some fringe elements that uh, would, uh, you know, from including those who promote uh, racist or conspiratorial thinking, these were present in the in these in these protests. Five minutes, Michael. Okay, thank you. So the uh, the Canadian truckers protest. Um, uh, the st uh, just to say a couple more words about the, the it was an unprecedented crackdown. The way the government uh, invoked the Emergencies Act. Uh, started seizing funds, working with banks to seize bank accounts, working with uh, private uh, online uh, money uh, companies like Go, uh, GoFundMe and uh, Send, uh, different uh, funding agencies. 
um, like give send go and go fund me. And in the media and the political response, it was complete uh, consensus painting the movement as extremist, racist, irrational, and conspiratorial uh, conspiracy theorist. Most people, uh, including conservative politicians, didn't want to touch the movement. So it was a popular conservative movement, but not populist because politicians were not uh, the politicians were, wanted to disassociate with the movement. So from this perspective, the problem seems to be too much unregulated speech. And the solution then becomes blame social media. This is out of control. We need to censor it. I think that's the wrong diagnosis. I think it's the wrong approach to solving the problem. Forgive me if I go over just a couple of minutes. What I want to start here is with this first point here. The social media algorithms reflect society. We hear so much the problem is social media. The algorithm rewards and promotes content that stirs strong emotions, positive or negative emotions, incendiary claims, vitriolic exchanges get amplified and receive the most attention. But isn't this also a problem for society and culture more broadly than just social media? If you think about water cooler talk or the ratings driven 24 hour news cycle or tabloid magazine covers, people love salacious drama. And it's all of our institutions reflect this. And uh, it, all we have to do is think back to the last Academy Awards. Does anyone remember anything about the films or the art of the last Academy Awards? We, this, the algorithm reflects the way our society is also prone to emphasize and amplify conflict and tension. So I think we need to focus more on the crisis itself rather than the social media symptom, though it does amplify the problem. And it's important to stress, crisis is not just material. Sometimes we get bogged down in a thinking that says that crises are solely empirical or logistical challenges or technocratic problems to be rationally solved. But crises are complex, multi-causal and socially constructed. They lend themselves to different interpretations and sometimes contradictory interpretations. And when they go on or compound and people suffer, or feel precarious, disposable, they lose faith in authorities, or uh, they lose faith in the confidence of the authorities to manage the problem. Minutes, and as the, how, sorry, how many? Did you say two minutes or one? Two. Thank you. Two. As the establishment fails to solve the crisis, at least in the lived experience of people's day-to-day -day lives, so the political opportunity for protest and populism and post-truth grows. Um, as confidence in institutions shrinks, alternative narratives and identities expand. And as the experience of crisis persists, you get a kind of outbidding process of alternative narratives trying to outdo each other, one more emotional or incendiary than the next. Discourse becomes increasingly radicalized, polarized, absolutist. In other words, crises generate post-truth. Social media happens to be a conduit for it and a magnifier, but not the cause. The cause is the structures of the crisis, not so easy to point out or resolve, but the, the appropriate target for debate and policy uh, and deliberation. So the more we can lessen the economic and social tensions of the crisis, uh, the toxicity of social media and discourse should lessen as well. And in this sense, from this perspective, the problem as underlined here is that people are susceptible to alternative and extremist ideologies because they feel left behind. And the solution from this point of view, finally, is to resist the polarization and division and censorship by not participating in it and focus on policies that help the people. This means, I think, resisting neoliberal austerity doctrines and reverting to or increasing public provision of basic needs. And I dare say, um, maybe uh, opening the door or beginning to support left populism along these lines as a kind of um, antidote. So um, that is my presentation and I will stop there and thank you all for your time. And I welcome some discussion about to these ideas uh, and look forward to hearing comments from my colleagues and. Uh, people uh, attending.
Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so next up, we have Maria Finstadter. Um, she's a visiting graduate student fellow at the Center of Global Studies, uh, and she has a she is a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Toronto. Prior to pursuing her doctoral studies, she received her Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from UVic in 2016 and her MA in Sociology from U of T in 2018. Her research focuses broadly on gender and radical right politics. For her doctoral research, she is examining how gendered inequality operates within radical right political parties, both at the level of supporters and politicians. So this work aims to understand that particular gendered drivers of radical right support and the place of women in racist and exclusionary politics. Um, so with that, I'll pass the mic to Maria. Thanks, Shukia, for the introduction. And thanks, Michael, for that very interesting presentation. Um, are my slides visible well? Is that OK? And I think from the thumbs up, too, you can hear me. Good. Um, right. So as Shukia mentioned, my dissertation research is focused on gender inequality and racism, anti-immigrant sentiment in the Nordic radical right. So this presentation I have today, I've pulled out of my dissertation. I'm focusing specifically on certain, um, I guess you could say, ideological or rhetorical tools of the radical right. So about how um, welfare chauvinism and progressive gender politics are being used by the radical right to make more palatable um, anti-immigrant policies and politics. So of the um, five Nordic countries, uh, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, all but Iceland has a politically significant radical right party. We have the Finns, the Danish People's Party, the Norwegian Progress Party, and the Sweden Democrats. Um, and I'll touch on this a bit later, but while these are all categorized as radical right parties, there's a huge range in their fiscal and social policies, right? Really what um, marries them together is the anti-immigrant politics. Um, Right, and these are all politically significant parties, right? So the uh, Sweden Democrats, um, after the last elections, I think one is just about to happen or is happening this fall, but after the last election, they had the third largest seat share in parliament. Um, the Finns for their part are uh, follow the Social Democrats as a close second in electoral support. And until recently, the Norwegian Progress Party sat in government as a junior partner in a coalition with conservatives, which fell apart over some political differences about treatment of Muslim women in particular. The odd one out of these four is the Danish People's Party, whose um, vote share has just collapsed. They lost about half of their vote in 2019 compared to 2015. But that said, this vote, uh, this vote loss has been explained as an effect of the left taking up an anti-immigrant stance and thereby eating into the radical rights voter base. So while we can see this as an electoral loss for the People's Party, it also points to a larger political win and that they are reshaping um, the political sphere in that country. So there's a lot of debate about just what constitutes a radical right party. And Jens Rydgren, I think, um, who's uh, an academic in Sweden, provides a particularly useful definition. He sees the radical right as a broad family of parties characterized by an anti-establishment populism and ethno-nationalist xenophobia whose platforms tend to be rooted in a social cultural authoritarianism that stresses the importance of collective good above individual rights. So the recent growth of the radical right in Europe is occurring within a larger context of political realignments, in particular to do with the weakening of party loyalties in Western Europe. So according to Kuro and, and colleagues in 2020, uh, the traditional cleavages in the Nordic countries around social and economic issues and class-based interests have largely been replaced by divide around post-materialist values, such as minority rights and environmentalism. And so this has eroded the traditional class bases of parties, including that of um, the radical right parties. So while traditionally the Finns pulled their support from the disaffected working class and from rural voters, in the last election, the majority of their support came from the educated middle class. Um, so just as traditional cleavages are declining in importance, party brands has been increasing in importance. So party brands have been shown to affect voter behavior as the um, symbolic and emotional values of party brands appeal more to certain voters than others. And also linked to this voter volatility is a marked shift towards issue-based voting. So just as voters are becoming less identified uh, with political, particular political parties, they're increasingly likely to make voting decisions based on specific policy points. 
underlining the importance of values and issue saliency to party choice. <coughs> Sorry. So as I mentioned, radical right parties um, do take up a wide range of fiscal and social policies. So among the Nordic, Nordic radical right parties, um, Norway's progress party is much more libertarian. Um, the Sweden Democrats are much more closely linked with um, the Nazi movement, um, as in current neo-Nazis, but then also they were founded by ex-Nazis after the Second World War. Um, but so within this context of, you know, various fiscal and social policies, it is anti-immigrant sentiment that serves as the commonality between the various parties occupying this political space. In fact, anti-immigrant sentiment is so central in radical right rhetoric and ideology that some scholars, particularly those working in the um, Dutch and French contexts, have started to argue that radical right parties are just anti-immigrant parties. That's all you need to call them. Um, and recent social and political events, some of these were touched on by Michael, such as the so-called migrant crisis starting around 2015, the 2008 crash and financial collapse, have really provided fertile soil for the European radical right to frame immigration as a key cultural and economic threat. Um, and specifically frames linking immigration to crime and social unrest and economic harm have been particularly profitable for these parties. So this quote I have up here is taken from the Danish People's Party's official program, which they make available in English as well as um, Danish, obviously. Um, so this is their translation, not mine. But they say that Denmark is not an anti-immigrant, is not an immigrant country, sorry, and never has been. Um, and they also say that Denmark belongs to the Danes and its citizens must be able to live in a secure community founded on the rule of law, which develops along the lines of Danish culture. So clear here is not only the hardline stance that the party takes against immigration, but also the importance of ethnicity and culture to the radical right notion of nationality and belonging. So traditionally a welfare state, a strong welfare state was considered to be a key factor to pressing support for radical right parties. And the idea which was originally put forward by Swank and Butts around 2003 um, is that the welfare state moderates the effects of immigration, capital mobility and trade openness that follow globalization, which tends to negatively impact mostly low skill and manual workers economically hurting primarily working class men. Um, so this led to what's generally called the losers of modernization theory of um, radical right support. However, the strong uh, welfare state of the Nordic countries has not prevented a rise in radical right politics. In fact, the radical right in the Nordic nations is characterized by a strong support of the welfare state, albeit within a welfare chauvinist framework. So welfare chauvinism, I have the quote up here, is defined as a system of collective social protection that's restricted to those belonging to the ethnically defined community who has contributed to it. And this is one way in which the understanding of outsiders as threats to the well-being of the nation state is practiced. All four national uh, radical right parties profess the need for strong social support for children, the elderly and the sick, but with the important caveat that it should not reach beyond the boundaries of citizenship and in this case, ethnic belonging. Um, welfare chauvinism then occurs when outsiders are understood as being threats to the well-being of the people and specifically as being threats by taking too much of state resources and by taking more from the state than they rightfully deserve. Um, and this language has been particularly potent in the Nordic countries where the welfare system is a prized good and a source of pride um, and a, a key piece of national identity, you could say. Um, and so there have been some recent social and political changes in these countries, for example, the um, the freedom of movement within the EU and the cross-border welfare rights that have followed that as populations are moving around for work more. And this has led to a certain level of decoupling of the right to social protection from membership to the national political community, giving rise um, to concerns about welfare tourism, scarcity of resources. So welfare chauvinism has really flourished within this context, um, in part by positioning the welfare state as a zero-sum social good that cannot be shared with outsiders. 
while also framing outsiders as risks to the social contract that created that welfare state. So they're both economic and cultural risks, you could say, or being framed as such, that caveat. So moving into the, the gender angle, um, radical parties are largely seen as men's parties, um, both because they're generally majority men, but also because of their masculine and even militaristic public images. Unsurprisingly then, the radical right parties of the Nordic countries are all majority male. Among currently sitting members of parliament, um, only between 28 and 38% of the radical right representatives are women. So to put these numbers into perspective, while only about a quarter of elected Democrat, Sweden Democrat representatives are women, about half of the parliament overall is women, as are 12 of the 22 current cabinet ministers. So there's some severe underrepresentation, and this underrepresentation holds at all levels of the radical right, where women are less likely than men to support these politics, to vote for these parties, and to participate and run for them and run for elective, uh, elected office within them. And this is all despite the rise of prominent women. So in the Nordic countries, we have Siv Jensen as the leader of the Norwegian Progress Party and Pia Kiersgaard was the leader of the Danish People's Party for a long time. Um, so despite their prominence um, and the, uh, the gender gap in support has not closed in these countries. And this is also despite the embrace of gender egalitarian language by the Nordic radical right. So these parties are increasingly using progressive sexual and gender politics to couch their Islamophobia. And um, this is a phenomenon which Sarah Ferris refers to as femonationalism in her 2017 book. And by no means is this uh, phenomenon specific to the radical right. She identifies it happening across a wide range of organizations, including um, like nonprofit aid groups working um, around the world. Um, but the radical right has found it to be particularly profitable. Um, and so what feminine nationalism does is frame gender egalitarianism and tolerance to sexual diversity as being inherently Western while framing misogyny and homophobia and intolerance as being foreign imports and in particular Muslim imports. And so in practice, this looks like things like um, the Danish People's Party proposing a ban on marriages for non-citizens under 25, um, or the Sweden Democrats uh, proclaiming that uh, gay Swedes are only unsafe in those neighborhoods that have too many immigrants. So we have this equation of the progressive with the Western. So clearly prior, parties need to prioritize communicating with voters, especially as voters becoming more single issue driven and less party loyal. So platforms are valuable tools here. They communicate to voters the policy preferences of the party, as well as sending broader messages about the ideological and symbolic in orientation of the party. So radical right voters, um, we know from research, are motivated by pragmatic concerns. They're not simply engaging in protest votes. They're aware of the party policies and are voting for them. Um, and so in their communications and their platforms, the Nordic radical right has adopted two particularly powerful rhetorical tools for drumming up support, um, welfare chauvinism and progressive gender language, which we can think of as femonationalism. These both allow them to make their politics more palatable and market themselves to broader audiences. Um, so for part of my dissertation research, I went through the party platforms and just tried to pull out key messages from their, um, their policy propositions. And that's what's on the screen here. But so welfare chauvinism is particularly clear in all of the party platforms. All parties state their commitment to caring for their citizens and frame social benefits as a national duty. However, they, there are also clear calls to limit access to welfare supports and um, to to citizens to prevent immigrants accessing these supports and to more strongly link social rights to citizenship. Um, there's also some uh, accusations throughout of immigrants abusing social services or taking too much money, not leaving enough to look after you know, the deserving citizens. 
Um, there are also nods towards a femonationalist way of thinking. That is the equation of the progressive with the Western. Um, so, for example, we have the Norwegian Progress Party's proposal to base integration on Norwegian values, um, and the Sweden Democrats' call to only welcome in those immigrants that um, adhere to Swedish cultures. And despite this, though, it's also clear how the radical right has remained committed to heteronormative expressions of gender and family, even while appropriating this rhetoric of gender egalitarianism. So we can see that these parties advocate for traditional family values and for the maintenance of traditional social hierarchies and cultural practices, deriving from a concern with the family as a vehicle of cultural transmission. Um, so I'll just wrap up because I only have one minute left, but um, so in conclusion, the rhetorical use of welfare chauvinism and progressive gender politics effectively presents anti-immigrant and racist politics as necessary for the defense of the national community. Um, Rather than plainly stating their distaste to racial and cultural difference, these parties instead state their support of tightly controlled immigration. And furthermore, in connecting threats to women's rights and threats to the stability of the welfare system to immigration alone, they absolve themselves of any responsibility for solving these problems outside of limiting immigration and obfuscate their own regressive positions on these topics. All right, thank you. Great job, Maria. That was great. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Um, up next, we have Benjamin Perrier. Um, Benjamin is a researcher in legal border studies at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. Um, he has been here since 2018. Um, he is a legal scholar who specializes in the law of borders, theory of borders, and cross-border cooperation law. Uh, he's working in the Borders and Globalization Database, the Borders and Globalization Podcast, and he's the French editor of the Borders and Globalization Review. So I'll leave it to you, Benjamin. Thank you, Shopia. Um, hello, everyone. I'm speaking from uh, the Liquid and People's Territory. Uh, thank you for your invitation to be here, and uh, I want to also thank uh, the BIG community and the CFGS uh, family. What I propose in these uh, 15 minutes is to present the article uh, that will be published uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Michael. Um, the purpose of this article was to question the ontological and political nature of the Yellow Vest movement in France. So as you know, maybe the Yellow Vest are the nickname given to an atypical social movement that appeared in France in November 2018, where uh, demonstrators wore a high visibility yellow vest and uh, they demonstrated uh, on roundabouts and every Saturday for a long month. So the article is based on one main idea, the, the idea of uh, neoliberalism, <laughs> Sorry. and its austerity policies is the condition of possibility of the emergence of the mobilization of the Yellow West. And also neoliberalism is also a threat against precarious people and against, against democracies. So finally, the Yellow West movement is the popular answer, a genuine, atypical and strong counter reaction to this uh, French policies. The article is divided in uh, three, three sections. So a first a section of context with uh, the presentation of posterity uh, and uh, the presentation of neoliberalism and the link between them, of course. Also the, the dominant ideology of the Emmanuel Macron, of, of the Macronism and also the presentation of the, 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 as the, of the neoliberalism as a threat against democracy. The second section is a description of the Yellow Vest movement. So we, the online origins, the main characteristics, and the main demands, also the different forms of the Yellow Vest movement, and especially the assembly of assemblies, and uh, obviously the strong and uh, political 
and police and judicial responses to the movement with a lot of violence against uh, the Yellowest uh, people. And the third section is about uh, the theorizing the movement of the Yellow West. The Yellow West movement is a social movement, but what type of social movement? Is it more horizontal movement? In what conditions? Is it a populist movement? Why not? And, uh, and the, the idea of this article is to say the populist lens is not uh, the best uh, grid of lecture and a grid of analysis of the, this movement. And of course, our conclusion of uh, the analysis of the Yellow West movement is that the Yellow West movement is an anti-neoliberal, pro-democracy, popular movement. So I will pass quickly on the neoliberalist, neoliberalist context, but is the, I think is the most important. And the most important thing in this article is to uh, identify the strong links, the strong linkages between uh, neoliberalism austerity policies, the emergence of, uh, of uh, Yellow Vest movement as the answer against uh, the French uh, style of uh, politics. Uh, the important uh, thing to note is that neoliberalism is actually the dominant ideology. And uh, this dominant ideology is uh, uh, diffused in legal uh, system and political policies. And the main effect of this uh, neoliberalism uh, ideology is the impoverishment of the most precarious people. And as we see, the statistics uh, speak for us. Uh, the French uh, country uh, has a lot of uh, uh, in increase of, of its poverty. And the last statistic uh, I have is about nine, two point million people who are under the line of the poverty. So it's a huge amount of precarious people in France, and it could explain also the uh, one of the conditions of the emergence of the Yellow West movement. So I will pass quickly of the main characteristic of neoliberalism, but as I said, it's very important to understand, uh, to understand the Yellow West movement. So neoliberalism is a four dimension, into an intertwined dimension, an ideology, a mode of governance, a policy package, and a particular form of capitalism, according to Steger and Roy in 2021. In a nutshell, neoliberalism means the instrumentalization of the state voluntarily or involuntarily, directly or indirectly, but at the at the at the at the end of the of the of the process, it's uh, the state is instrumentalized by some ideas. And uh, some uh, one good phrase about that is about uh, I find it's from uh, Godin. He says the characteristics of neoliberalism is to be a mode of management of capitalism, which is based on a state at the service of capital against labor. And we live, uh, as you know, we live in the in the world dominated by financial markets, and as Michiro said, to uh, when you ago. <laughs> so neoliberalism is not only an ideology, huh? it's a set of measures, it's a set of economic policies. Uh, it implies a, a reduction of unemployment benefits. It implies also privatization of public sectors. It implies an uh, increase uh, the direct or uh, an indirect taxes. So this austerity as a weapon of uh, neoliberalism uh, conduct to the impoverishment of the most precarious people. Finally, also, and we don't have to forget this dimension of neoliberalism, neoliberalism is a direct threat against democracy, as some authors have studied uh, deeply this, uh, this, uh, the consequences of, of neoliberalism uh, on our uh, democratic systems. And I will quote uh, Carré and Chaton, they say democracy itself is threatened by neoliberalism, and I will quote Braun. Uh, she said, uh, the economic rationality of neoliberalism has become a governmentality. It means a set of techniques, practices, and values of power that have superseded democracy. 
So uh, the context, this context of neoliberalism and austerity, austerity in mind, we could uh, move on. The second section of the article is the description of the ELMS movement. So of course, uh, it will be just uh, today a description at the surface. Uh, it's a complex movement with multiple branches, uh, multiple uh, initiatives, but it was all around France. And it's a, it's a good laboratory to, uh, to understand better the impacts of uh, neoliberalism on the French society. As uh, we know, uh, the movement began in the form of online discussions and networking outside the traditional uh, union uh, frameworks. That's one of the specificity. Uh, some some uh, some um, some web web pages uh, existed before against uh, different things. Uh, the main one of the main uh, trigger was this uh, petition from uh, Priscilla Ludowski uh, about. Uh, against the increase of uh, against the decision of the French government to increase the price of the fuel. So this uh, petition uh, got a lot of success online. Uh, in a nutshell, Yellow Vest is also a digital, it's mainly a digital phenomenon at the start. So at the start, it means uh, October 2019 and, and November 20, uh, sorry, October 2018 and November 2018. Um, and uh, different key videos uh, published online where, uh, where the, mo the most important triggers to gather most than 300,000 people in the 17th November of 2018. Uh, in a nutshell, this, this, the politics, this decision of French government to increase the fuel tax uh, impacted the people who needed their cars and impacted uh, spe specifically the people who need their cars to drive uh, for, uh, for their jobs, for their works. Uh, other, analysts, uh, other analysts say the, the, the Elvis movement impacted uh, the constraint budget, the people who can't afford uh, to pay a little bit more the fuel, uh, the fuel, uh, the need of fuel for their uh, daily lives, specifically the people, as I said, who are working uh, from a village to a second village at uh, 10 or 20 or 30 kilometers. So if we analyze deeply uh, the reason of the French decision to increase this fuel, uh, it was the, the, the frame that has a, they frame that as a tool to finance the ecological transition but finally, it was uh, a decision uh, on the backs of the most precarious people uh, and that uh, appeared uh, during the Macron leaks. So everyone know that at the starting of the Yellow Vest movement. So what, who are the Yellow Vest movement? So we noticed uh, some, uh, some, uh, some surveys and some strong anal analysis noticed. Five minutes, Ben. Okay, it was a strong presence of workers and employees, a presence of multi-class composition, uh, craftsmen, also auto, auto entrepreneurs, nurses, small employers, proletarians. Uh, one specific of, Yellow, of the Yellow Vest movement was the strong support of the French population, like 70% for the, the most important months at the end of November 2018 to January, February 2019. The French population was supporting the Yellow, the, the Yellow Vest movement and their revendications. So, in a nutshell, a few key specific elements. Uh, of course, the, the, the wearing the Yellow Vest as a sign of, uh, rala, uh, of, of sharing the same condition of life and the same uh, motivation against the, 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 the French government. So, of course, it was an atypical movement with, with partisans of. All, all the political spectrum and outside union framework. We notice also the presence of, uh, of uh, primo manifesto of novices in the protest, specifically, specifically women and uh, retired people. Uh, one other key specific element is the daily presence on the roundabout. And they build some uh, cabins, some huts 
and they, they stay in these uh, cabins uh, all uh, all the days and for discussing, for exchanging. Some people speak about the second family of uh, Yellow Bess, so it's a strong fraternity movement on the ground of the French, uh, uh, French uh, system. Oh, uh, of course, it's, uh, the Yellow Vest is every Saturday for more than one year. <coughs> so they, they number the number of acts. One act is one Saturday. So it, in an, uh, we have 80 acts, so it's 80 Saturdays. So it's a, it's a long, long time, etc., etc. We notice also the important uh, key element of the assembly of assembly. And also the 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 detestation uh, against the president for his arrogance. That was also a key uh, a key uh, feature of the of the movement of the federation of this this, this different these different people. Uh, at, uh, immediately after the the, the 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 start of this movement, uh, they decided all the people rally uh, for. Uh, for the referendum of uh, the from the initiative of citizens, that was a key uh, common motivation of the different uh, yellow vest people. And in a nutshell, their message: it, they wanted more dignity for everyone and also more purchasing power. Two minutes, then. Okay, I will maybe I will uh, pass uh, for one minute. So, two pictures very symbolic of this yellow vest movement, the roundabouts, presence, and the uh, Saturday's um, tri strikes in town. Some cabin still exists today. So this cabin in the one of road is, uh, has been destroyed <laughs> 15 times, but all the time the yellow vest are rebuilding this, this, uh, this cabin and it still exists today. Um, so the, the referendum by initiative of citizens is a strong legal idea to reform the French state. I don't enter in the details, but that's a key element to have more direct democracy, more uh, direct impact of the political life of, of, of the French uh, system. The, the, the assembly of assembly was very, uh, very interested to analyze. Uh, and we notice for now six uh, assembly of assembly where different people and different delegation of people all around France gather in different uh, cities and towns in France where they share a lot of uh, uh, ideas and they a lot of uh, debates, etc. And we arrive at our conclusion. The Yellow Vest movement through the populist prism is not relevant. The analysis of uh, Yellow Vest movement through the social movement categories are insufficient and incomplete. And we, uh, we defend the idea with, in this article that the Yellow Vest movement is a popular movement of genuine people, of people from the ground, of the most precarious uh, impacted by the neoliberalism strategy and the austerity policies of Macronism and uh, Emmanuel Macron and its government. Uh, we, of course, we detailed in the articles uh, preci precisely why it's not a populist movement and why social movement theory are useful but incomplete. And we arrive at this conclusion that uh, Yellow West movement is a social or popular movement. Uh, revealing a popular intellectual revolution of the most precarious people and their sympathizants in France. And we call uh, some people are uh, uh, also analyze, analyzing the Yellow Vest movement through the lens of the improvement of democracy and specifically improvement of the democratic constitutionalism instead of the constitutional, uh, the instead of the democracy, uh, sorry, uh, the democratic constitutionalism is more a democracy shaped by a constitution than a constitution shaped by democracy. And we love this concept of Dominique Rousseau, a constitutionalist uh, famous in France. He spoke about continuous democracy. And, and, and with that conclusion, as France became a neoliberal authoritarian state, and we, when we analyze the different uh, laws 
uh, different legal dispositives of French Macronism, we could uh, justify our, uh, our, our, our demonstration that the Macronism integrates anti-democratic practices with a degree of violence uh, very strong. And that's also a key of element. Uh, the Yellow Vest Movement has been uh, uh, repressed by a neoliberal authoritarian state uh, with a lot of violence. Example, 30 people lost one of their eyes, 11 deaths, uh, a few ends torn off, a lot of end injuries, and I will stop it. And thank you for, for, your, for your listening. It was difficult to <laughs> summarize all these things, but <laughs> I respected the time. Thank you, Laura. Amazing. Great job, everyone. Um, so I want to thank all of our speakers and also all of our listeners today. Um, everyone here has played an important job in the success of this event. Uh, we'll move on now to the question and answer portion. Uh, so the intention here is to really be conversational. Um, so feel free if you have a question to post it in the chat uh, or turn your camera on or just turn on your mic um, and, and share it with us. Uh, again, we ask that everyone be respectful of all the panelists and all the attendees at this time. Um, if your question is for a particular speaker, um, please feel free to name that. Uh, but I will give everyone the opportunity to respond to every question uh, that, is, that is posed. Um, I do have a question, if I can start. <laughs> um, something that each of you brought up was kind of this idea of imagery or identity within kind of imagery. So Michael, you talked about um, social media and and even though it's a red herring, it's still kind of that persuasive power of, of images. And Maria, you talked about kind of the shift in branding um, of national politics. And then Benjamin, you talked about kind of the actual physicality of, of the yellow vest, of these flags, of kind of the spectacle and, and seeing it um, with the LFS protest. So I'm curious if um, if this if kind of looking at the pervasive power of those images were part of your methods um, or kind of how you see that shifting with identity politics um, in today's nationalist era. Should I start? Sure. Um, it hasn't been a key focus of mine yet, but I'm hoping to get a little bit more into this. I think, so I'll, I'll backtrack. You're talking about identity and I was saying that, you know, the welfare state, support for the welfare state, as well as these um, progressive gendered politics, um, how important that has been to the identity within these Nordic countries and how the radical right has used that to sort of revamp their image a little bit. Um, and that's a bit, I guess, less my work than the literature that's already out there. But I think that there is something really interesting there about um, almost like the, the two-facedness of it. So I've been doing some reading more recently about um, the Rassemblement National, the, the French radical right, and Marine Le Pen, and how you know she's gone on this big, project of uh, de-demonization, they call it, of the party, which is really only a rhetorical change, right? The, the politics have changed very little since her father was in charge, but under her leadership, you know, she talks about herself being a single mom all the time, about raising her kids by herself, about taking on this work, standing up for the women of France. Um, there's lots of rhetoric there about protecting women's rights as being French rights. Um, and so I think maybe the importance of that kind of language is both in how it appeals to this like broader um, segment of the population. And it also plugs into narratives that we kind of already have about um, what's that famous line about white women protecting brown women from brown men. Like it's very much that kind of ideology that's being picked up by these groups. But I think it's also really useful for them in how it absolves them completely of responsibility, right? Like you don't need to take care of women's rights and women's position in society if it's, if, you know, 
say that the Swedes are inherently feminist and it's really these outside influences that are, are ruining everything for society. Um, yeah, that's my thoughts, I guess. Could you quickly uh, summarize the question again? Oh, I was just asking if, because each of you kind of spoke to these rhetorical or, or um, the, how images kind of play into these new identity and nationalist politics. So uh, social media is a fantastic example, right? You have these memes, you have these kind of ways of thinking. Um, so I was just curious if, if that was part of your methods or methodology and kind of developing your arguments, um, or if that's sort of a trend that you see change over time that you wanted to speak to. Ben, do you want to comment? So uh, the Yellow Face movement uh, are completely uh, this uh, <laughs> not related with nationalism movement and not related with post-truth movement, even though, of course, it exists because online participation, online uh, sharing web pages, but it's completely not the main uh, feature of the Yellow Vest movement. Uh, some some uh, legal some specialists about uh, populism speak about the nationalism populist populist movement but uh, if we if we know their criteria and we compare this criteria of national nationalist nationalist populism to the movement of uh, the yellow vest movement we don't identify uh, a uh, strong connection, and uh, even though a relative connection with a nationalist movement, even though at the start, uh, some right wing uh, people and some left uh, wing people were connected together against uh, the decision of the of Emmanuel Macron. So the key feature of the Yellow West movement is to be not nationalism, and is to be is to gather different people with precarious condition from all the spectrum policy, but we can't interpret that as uh, uh, as the nationalist populism. And uh, and uh, of course, our method was to to read uh, hundreds of um, studies, hundreds of papers. Uh, uh, we watch a lot of videos uh, about uh, the Yellow Vest movement, about uh, the spokespersons, about uh, and we study also different surveys made online. So uh, I think uh, our method is uh, strong enough to to justify our narratives and our analysis outside the box of uh, populist movements and outside the box of nationalism interpretations. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great question, and it's it shows uh, where a lot more work needs to be done in sort of. Uh, kind of social media discourse analysis, linking it to identity and issues of nationalism. Um, it's something that I need to do more work on in the context of the Canadian truckers. But I do also think that um, the category of nationalism or identity politics is maybe not the best lens for this particular case, uh, or indeed for the Yellow Vests. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the Canadian truckers and the Yellow Vests, of course. Um, and in my impulse is to push back against that and to even resist that kind of analysis when I'm tr when I would like to see more discussion about the policy around the particular crises that are driving the sort of instability which create the conditions for a more radical, contentious politics. Um, but I appreciate the, the, the question. Great answers, everyone. Um, Dr. Burnett Shani, did you have a question that you wanted to pose? Yeah, I have some comments, um, mostly questions actually for Michael, Maya, and Ben. Um, So Michael, I really, uh, I found the presentation super interesting. And I was wondering more specifically about, you know, something that Maya discussed a bit as, as well, which is um, the specificity of some issues. It's like, I have a difficulty understanding this well, right? Because usually you have big tent parties, political parties that kind of have broad agendas and people are, you know, ideologically basically working following their the, these political parties and now what we discuss what we're looking at is the very specific support 
for an issue. And in your case, or in the Canadian specific case, in you know, looking at the tracking uh, protest, you say that Canadian, a majority of, or almost a majority of Canadians were in support of some of the issues which had to do with the, I guess, the passport uh, requirement. Um, but disagreed with the uh, protest um, activist, activists and the protest techniques, basically, that they use to, because, uh, you know, too violent or if not too violent, at least interfering with life in Ottawa. So I wanted you to maybe ex explore this a little bit more because for me, it's, I mean, you know, I'm still a student of Duverger when I look at this and I, I still think that political parties basically and ideologies are really important. And what we have here is a complete de deconstruction of ideologies into very issue specific um, phenomenons and and in a way bundles of issues um, as Maya uh, dis Maya discussed a little bit and so I I wanted to ask Maya almost the same question but a little bit different which is if uh, Maria if the if uh, uh, you know there are single issue trends across those radical movements let's call them movements. How do political parties that represent these movements articulate them? Or are there issue specific political parties, right? Because one of the things that you're focusing on, the FEMO, FEMO nationalism and the welfare chauvinism, for instance, would be two issues that are basically present across, present across almost all of your, I think all of your case studies, and we could almost find them as well in the French case, in the recent French election and in, in what uh, Benjamin discussed a bit. And now for you, Benjamin, I have a little bit of a different question is that I wondered if you had looked at how Yellow West voted in the last uh, presidential election. And um, because um, from what I know, there was quite a bit of support from the Yellow West movement and vote to, to, towards uh, Le Pen, right? Whose uh, um, movement got maybe about 40% of the Yellow West votes. Um, and then some other, some other movements such as uh, Mélenchon, Mélenchon, so the extreme, right, the extreme left, but also um, Zemmour got some support as well. So in other words, these different political parties have and, and so my question is, um, you know, um, how do you reconcile the argument in your paper with the fact that the Yellow West actually are quite um, uh, active in voting, but they it's scattered across, you know, fairly polarized parties, right, and fairly polarized views. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emmanuel. I guess I'll start. I think that's a super important question of just to reiterate the question about um, the distinction on the one hand between um, uh, between 43 and 47 percent of the Canadian public being sympathetic to the frustrations and the key sort of core stated grievances of the movement, which was this frustration about uh, very strict mandates lockdown rules, the vaccine passport. Um, but on the other hand, um, for the most part, you could even say hated the protesters and their tactics, sort of the messaging, the association with the far right, you know, some of the spoilers with the uh, Nazi flags and uh, some of the disruptions in downtown Ottawa, and also, of course, the disruptions to the uh, economy as borders were were actually shut down. The key border crossing in North America was closed for a week during during this period. So, uh, and it came at a time, you know, after two years of uh, very a lot of pent up uh, frustration. I think so. I think to the extent that the Canadian public was sympathetic to the frustration, re reflected a general malaise and people being tired uh, of coronavirus uh, in general. So, on the one hand, the movement 
was very issue specific, but on the other hand, it was also very issue vague because while it started with a very specific grievance and demand because it lacked centralization uh, and was more or less ostracized by the mainstream press and political establishment, it also became sort of a grab bag or a collect all for general frustration, mostly right-wing or conservative frustration about sort of the state of the world generally. So, I mean, it, on the one hand, there was a core specific grievance, but on the other hand, it became uh, very uh, sort of amorphous and imprecise. Thank you. And I don't have the statistics of the Yellow Vest movement, of, uh, sorry, of the votes of the Yellow Vest, but I have a, I have a, a statistic of the voters uh, through the lens of their uh, revenues. So the people who earn less than 1,000 euros by month, they, uh, 30, 35% have voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon and almost the same, 32, 33% have voted for Marine Le Pen. So the people uh, who earn less than uh, 1,000 euros by month, they are almost divided in two uh, to the, the, the same amount of people. Uh, so if we if we uh, connect the, the feature of the yellow movement, the yellow vest movement as the most precarious people, it could be uh, good uh, in this uh, information about the yellow vest votes if they are the, the, the most precarious people. So um, and for the second scale, so the people who, who earn between 1,000 euros and 2,000 euros by month, it's almost the same amount of people who avoid, who voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon, we have maybe 26%, and for the Marine Le Pen is uh, maybe uh, 25%. So uh, what, could, what are the takeaway of this uh, statistic? The people who earn the less money by month are completely divided in two. Uh, one big amount for you, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, and one big amount for uh, Marine Le Pen. And more, more you earn money by month, more the central party, central right party of uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, got uh, voters for him. Um, I, I'm going to push more, Benjamin, because um, I think one of the things I find interesting in these statistics is it reminds me of one of the strategy Francois Mitterrand had when he created pro proportional representation in the French system. It was said that he wanted to in, you know, implement proportional representation because it would basically divide the right. Right? It would divide the right because Le Pen would actually be able to compete with the other uh, right leaders. And it actually worked. Every time he used it, he was able to have what was called a, you know, a government of cohabitation. So the government of cohabitation at the time was the idea that he would co-govern with other parties, basically, but would be re-elected, right? And so, but the re the fundamental reason was that in that case, what you had is basically a vote of contestation. And I want to ask you, are we not in the same scenario again? Basically, both right and left are divided, but the main, you know, the main, the center remains at 58% for Macron. It doesn't mean he will be able to vote, uh, sorry, to govern very easily, but he's in a situation where the center, 58% versus 63 in the last ele present presidential election, in a way regroups, you know, and so the most different disenfranchised population of France is highly divided and polarized ar around very specific issues. So is there, con is it, are these movements of contestation? Are they just growing? What, what's going on? Okay, so the most important uh, part of the population who vote for Macron are the seniors, are the retirees people at 70%. 70% of the people, uh, retiring, retired people have voted for, uh, for Macron and also a, a part of the young people between 18 years old to, to 24 years old. That's the two main 
uh, origins of uh, the voters for Macron, but the most important uh, piece is the vote of the retiring, uh, retired people. So it's, it's uh, original to think like that because uh, Macron has decided to extend the, the age of uh, the retiring people. And that's the already, that's the people already uh, retiring that are voting for him. So it's like the retiring people are not thinking for the people who are following them, <laughs> the, the, the 15 years younger than them, because the, that's, 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 the, that's the important uh, key feature of the, the election of Macron. So the election of Macron by a lot of retired people, 70% is a huge amount. And um, if we want to follow the, 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 the actuality of the next months of French, uh, um, French political system, in two months, we will have the legisl legislatives, uh, the election, election legislative, and the yellow vest, the, the, sorry, the Jean-Luc Mélenchon idea was to uh, get this cohabitation, was to reach this cohabitation with Macron, so to force him to cohabitate. If he succeeds, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, to gather all the left uh, parties all together, so Communist Party, Socialist Party, uh, Green Party, and that's the idea of the party of Jean-Luc Mélenchon called Union Populaire, to uh, force Macron to have a cohabitation and to be uh, the first minister uh, of, of, of France. So that's, that's the parallel I could make with your, uh, with your historical example of, of. Before we go further down in this topic, I want to give Maria a chance to respond to, um, to the question that was posed. And then we can go back to this if there's, if there's interest in engaging. Sure, thanks Yuko. Um, so I have, so Emmanuel, you were asking about, um, you know, single issue voting versus big, um, big party tents, big tent parties, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and so I have a couple, you know, kind of ideas about that. I'm just vamping here. Um, but I think there's two things that came to mind for me while you were asking your question. And first is that um, I, within my work on the Nordic parties, I actually don't think that feminationalism and welfare chauvinism are two issues. I think that they are two ways of expressing the same issue, which is this anti-immigrant politics, right? Like that's what the party is focused on. Um, but then I also think that there can be a disconnect, right? Single issue voters does not mean single issue parties. And part of the big tent party is that they have a lot of single issues that appeal to single issue voters. Um, you know, people who vote Republican in the States just because they wanna end abortion and they don't really care about anything else. Um, but I think it's also a question of, I guess you could call it politicking. So the, the Nordic radical right parties are focused on anti-immigration specifically through these frameworks of feminationalism and welfare chauvinism because they know that that appeals to the crowd more so than say some of their policies like the Norwegian Progress Party has a lot of policies about um, lowering taxation and these sort of classic libertarian lines about removing barriers to business. Anyway, um, and it makes me think in the Canadian context about like the PPC in the last election, right? So they campaigned hugely on this vote of vaccination. Um, and I live just a couple blocks from the legislature here in Victoria. And the protests last fall um, and the late summer, there was always tons of PPC posters, people wearing the t-shirts, um, like a real sort of melding of those two movements. But then when you read the actual PPC um, platform, there's a couple lines about healthcare and vaccination and the rest is all about um, immigration. And, um, and so they're really clearly a single issue party on immigration, right? Their solution to the housing crisis was to end immigration so there'd be less demand for houses. Um, but then they are campaigning on this vaccination issue as a, a kind of a politicking, a political game. Um, yeah, does that so answer your question? Can, can I, yeah, you have, I, I think it's really interesting because 
as you you know you you know a little bit that I follow French politics probably best, and I don't know Scandinavian politics so well. But in the French case, Marine Le Pen campaigned verbally quite far away from her political platform, which, if you read, has not changed much from what was written by her father. Right? It's a little bit more streamlined, anti-immigrant, basically xenophobic. But her her campaign was almost much more progressive, um, and it it targeted groups that were both, I would say, traditional blue collar workers, right? Um, where she has quite a bit of support, um, as well as I would say the fringe xenophobic core of the party, and she managed in a way to. And, and that's something I can't reconciliate. I find this really bizarre that you would have a camp campaign that is, you know, both much broader, but also targeting very specific groups, assuming that these people don't read the platform and have no idea about it. Is that kind of a common point across all these parties also in Scandinavia? And I think so, yeah. Um not necessarily being super interested in the platforms. Um, but also I think because rhetoric is powerful. Um, you know, it's not just words. Um, like I think her, what was it? She had a like a three point campaign, right? There's some, um, and one of them was pouvoir uh, d'achat. So like uh, spending power and cost of living was huge. And that's, you know, massively resonant um, regardless of what the platform says. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that I think what I'm hearing and something that you each talked about in your um, presentations that really struck with me is this idea of like, there's really complex, these are really complex phenomenons. And I, I think that's something that you each did really well is kind of giving, um, or like lending rationality, like describing like the kind of pragmatically or practically, like what what are the drivers behind these things? What are the interests involved? Um, which I think is really wonderful because to Michael's point in Canada, we see a lot of um, uh, maybe distaste uh, or just thinking or kind of shoving everything into one area as, as this fringe area without kind of grappling with what is appealing about it? Uh, what does it speak to? So uh, thank you to each of you for kind of naming that and, and kind of bringing up that it's these technocratic solutions don't necessarily address um, address these drivers. Michael, I see your hand up. Did you want to speak? I do have a question for Maria, but I, I want I don't want and, and I want to see if someone in the audience has a question or comment first. But if not, I, I have a question. Going. I think you're probably good to go. Going. Okay. <laughs> so Maria. There's something about your presentation that I think fundamentally challenges the direction I'm coming from, because I'm trying to say that we should be looking to the sort of austerity conditions of precarity that, are, that is the fundamental driver that would explain these sorts of things. And I think you can really see that in France and you can see that in Canada as well. But the Nordic countries are so famous for their strong, robust um, social safety nets. And you talk about social welfare chauvinism. And I'm wondering, is this happening even as the public feels like um, they still like they haven't had a, an, an erosion of social welfare? Or has is there a sense among the public that things are being rolled back? The, the belt is getting tighter. And that could be a driver to the uh, sort of chauvinism that you're describing. Or is it as very much in there? It, it, a purely a discourse and political thing, because in fact, the social welfare system has not been hit by neoliberalism, neo, neoliberalism and austerity as some of these other countries are. So I'm wondering if your case in itself is a bit of an argument against my argument, or if the, if the conditions of uh, precarity have also been a factor or a perceived factor among the publics you're looking at. Sure. Um, okay try to be as streamlined as possible. I think that perceived factors is like the, that's the key word, right? Um, there's been research on, I think, especially in the Greek context, because you've had a massive resurgence in neo-fascism there with Golden Dawn. Um, 
And they were also obviously hit really hard by the recession and by austerity measures. And it's not real life financial hardship that motivates people to engage in anti-democratic and regressive politics. It's perceptions of hardship. And it's perceptions of hardship that erode trust in public institutions. And so I think like in the Nordic context, an example of that is that Iceland was by far the hardest hit by the economic collapse. Um, it was just destroyed, right? The banks owed something like 10 times the country's GDP at the time when they collapsed. And there hasn't been this kind of um, political movement there to the same degree. So I think it, it really has to do with perceptions. And I think perceptions are important because it's, it's never just austerity and financial hardship, right? It's always this interplay between supply and demand. So these conditions of hardship, high immigration rates, um, social unrest, they only result in support for these politics when those politics make themselves available. Um, so you can have you know, one without the other and then it inevitably fails. You have to have this, this perfect um, storm. And then just because we're getting close, I'll just finish up by saying, I think um, part of the, because I'm approaching it from the party angle, I also think it's important to think about how these parties create their own demand, right? They produce frames linking immigration to social unrest and um, linking EU overreach and political interference to austerity and economic hardship um, and circulate those throughout the, um, you know, the public sphere, you could say. Yeah, that's great, thank you. No problem. Michael, did you want to quickly respond? Um, uh, no, I accept to say that um, certainly, with, if you look at the yellow vest as an example, it's actually not the poorest stratum of French society. It's, it's, it's more of a suburban or rural, smaller town, smaller cities. And though they are among the lower middle class, uh, they certainly are not the most hard hit. And I think this comes back to perceptions, but these are this was precisely the population that feels like they should have more entitlement, a, you know, more spending power, more say in the democratic process. And so it's the sense of a, la a lack of uh, entitlement or a loss of influence or being left behind that, that drives the movement more than poverty per se, which is an interesting point. Great, thank you. Well, with that, I think that we'll close for today. Uh, but I want to thank each of our speakers. So thank you, Michael, Maria, and Ben for your wonderful talks. Uh, I can say that I learned a lot. And thank you to everyone who attended and all of our listeners. Um, as I said before, we all played an important role today in making this a successful event. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Shukia, very much for your moderation. Yeah, thanks so much, Shukia. And thanks, Ben and Michael. And thank you for all the participants. Mm -hmm.